Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today is day two of the uh, Sing Life 32nd uh, edition. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, start the uh, day again and uh, in this session, uh, particularly the live case. Uh, this is a very special case from uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Uh, they are famed uh, locally and regionally, I think, uh, for uh, drug-coated balloon uh, interventions, and I have none other than uh, uh, Dr. Paul Ong, uh, who is one of the uh, leading experts in this region, and I think I would say uh, in the world, and m many others here who are very real experts in uh, DCB uh, uh, treatment and uh, management. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, open the case and uh, um, get to the Tan Tok Seng Hospital. But before I do that, I'd just like to quickly introduce the rest, the rest of the panel members. Uh, uh, Dr. Ho Kei Woon from uh, Heart Centre, uh, Dr. Hong Miao Ki uh, from Korea, uh, Dr. Idu, uh, Muhammad Idu John from my, uh, Sengkang and uh, Heart Centre, uh, Dr. Anek uh, Kanoskit from Thailand, uh, Dr. Liu Hongbang from uh, Malaysia, uh, Sabah, uh, Dr. Theodore Martel uh, from Romania, I believe, yeah. uh, Dr. Rosley, uh, well, well known, uh, we all know him well, from now from CBS uh, KL, uh, Dr. Bruno Scheller, yeah, needs no introduction, you know, he's one of the four uh, forefathers of uh, DCB treatment, and uh, Dr. Upu uh, Vikarama Chichi, hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, from uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Deborah Lee from Tan Tok Seng Hospital, is an uh, up-and-coming young interventionist. Uh, thank you all very much. So, can we go straight to the live at Tan Tok Seng? Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Ko. C can you hear us? Yes, uh, I'll hand it over to Paul to, to uh, discuss with you, Paul. Hey, Kaiwa, by him, good morning. Morning, morning. morning, morning. So, uh, good morning, uh, Professor Ko, uh, Paul, and the uh, uh, distinguished panel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sing Life for inviting uh, Tanto Singh to do a live case uh, demonstrating the use of drug coated balloon. Uh, next to me is my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Faim Jafari, who's uh, going to be my co primary operator. And we have Dr. Cliff, who's going to help out with the QFR uh, analysis. We have a team of uh, our CAF lab team uh, members are helping out in the background. Uh. So I'm just going to uh, hand over to Fahim to present the details of the case. Sure. So uh, thank you very much. So let's go on to the case. Uh, this is a 64-year-old gentleman, a uh, non-smoker, who's actually been in good health in the past and came in the end of uh, last year with an acute inferior STEMI, uh, presented to the ED with chest pain, was defibrillated a couple of times in the ED, uh, and then brought to the cat lab. That's his EKG showing very subtle inferior ST elevation. Um, and uh, you can see on the, on the images, he had an occluded, acutely occluded RCA that was uh, successfully stented with uh, two drug eluding stents. Door to balloon time was about 40 minutes. Uh, today we are uh, now going to address his other non-culprit lesions. So you can see on the still images, and we'll show you the live images in a second, uh, there is a tight lesion in the distal OM, and then there is a significant lesion in the distal LAD on the right panel, uh, and a moderate lesion in the proximal LAD. Uh, at that time, next please. Uh, he was, uh, you know, the EF was 50% by echo. Uh, labs showed significant hyperlipidemia, but no overt diabetes, and he was discharged on aspirin and ticagrelor. Next slide, please. Um, so the question then is, how would you treat this? Uh, you know, there are these uh, tight lesions uh, in the OM as well as in the distal LAD. Uh, we did uh, an initial functional assessment. Uh, next, please. Uh, and, you know, QR, we did a QFR at the time of the, inter the initial intervention, and I'm going to ask Cliff to point out the QFR that we did at that time, and then we did another QFR today. Thanks, Alpine. So, uh, as you can see over here, this is the QFR done at the index PCI two weeks back, and the QFR of the LAD is actually 0.51. 
And the clear file analysis pointed out three lesions. And, and lesion one there is where you see the markers in, uh, demarcate. At approximate LED, the delta drop is 0.16, which is pretty significant. And then after that, there's a lesion two, which is mild, and it's also a delta drop of 0.03 only, and which is the more severe angiographically lesion, the distal LED, and there's a significant delta drop of the clear file of 0.27. So we wanted to see whether it's just the proximal or the distal LED that we want to intervene on, and we use a user-defined um, and geographic analysis of the QFR, and at the proximal to mid LED, the delta drop is only 0.22. So it seems like we need to intervene on both the prox and the distal LED. And we repeated the QFR today again, which shows the QFR of 0 0.50, which is very similar to the 0 0.51 that we had two weeks ago uh, during the index PCI. So we did an so uh, maybe, IFR uh, pullback sorry, as well as FFR today, and uh, I just want to show this to you and then have the panel tell us what you think we should do. So you can see that there is a, both IFR and FFR are concordant and significant. There is predominant pressure losses at the distal LED lesion, which is the, uh, you know, the target of today's intervention, and then there's some drop proximally. So with this, I will hand it back to uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Ho, and, uh, and to the panel, and uh, let's uh, discuss what you all think we should thank, do. Thank you very so much, Dr. So the the if you look at it, uh, angiography is about 60 to 70 percent, but uh, whether to intervene, I think, uh, is a point of contention. So but I'll leave it to uh, the panel to uh, discuss. Okay, thank you very much, Fahim and Kaiwa. It's a, it's a in very interesting case, and I can see that a very diffuse LED. So you have a patient presented with inferior infarct, and now you're staging the left coronary artery. So maybe we will invite some um, discussion on how to uh, treat this lesion. Um, uh, you did a fair bit of work on the QFR up front. Maybe, you know, Rosli is here, and I haven't seen my friend for a while. Rosli, you, you do have tons of QFR. Do you want to, you know, comment on, on that finding? Would you have done the same? Yeah, I mean, the, we have got uh, QFR. Uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, wanted to um, be uh, more certain and we compared with an FFR. And so far, uh, in most lesions, I'm quite comfortable with uh, QFR. So over here, as has been pointed out, that, uh, uh, you know, the distal lesion, I think, is significant and uh, you may want to treat it, but the uh, interest was actually in proximal. And uh, from the QFR, it appears that the proximal is a significant disease. Yep. I would treat that too. So, so in this case, I think the QFR probably will, you know, change our management, right? Some of us probably would not go and change that lab, distal LED, but from the pressure wire studies and also the QFR, it seems that the distal LED is significant. Can I also remind the audience that there is a, you know, there's an app. Please, if you have questions, please post it. Uh, sitting next to me is Deborah. She will be uh, screening all the questions being posted, and we will try and raise the questions to the panel, uh, please, in, uh, in the contribute to the discussion. Um, I also saw that you have an IFR pullback. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, you Paul, uh, you Paul, you are here. Would you like to comment on the um, IFR findings? Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Uh, so good morning. Yes, uh, I think as the IFR pullback suggests, there are uh, two two jumps. First, the distal lesion, uh, and also I think there's a clear jump in the proximal lesion as well. So. Uh, it is tricky, but I think, uh, in my mind, uh, definitely the, it treat the distal. But I am in more favor of treating the proximal LED lesion as well, looking at this IFR pullback. So the lesions sometimes can interact with each other. So you're saying, uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite exactly get you. You, you. What would you do again? Pardon? So you know, you're saying that you would tackle the proximal lesion L first? Lesion as well. Uh, no, uh, I think. I know I would start with the distal lesion, yep. but I, I'm, I'm in favor of treating the proximal lesion as well. Okay. Yep. So um, maybe a quick comment from Bruno. Um, you know, you, you are the father of DCB, and we are in the DCB session. So what would your strategy be here? Uh, so I didn't get your, your last So what, what would your strategy be for in treating this, this patient? How would you approach it? As, as you said, we are in the, in the DCB session. and. Um, I would apply, of course, the, the principle of DCB only. This means uh, predilate, prep the lesion, and then uh, decide what. Yeah. So, so I think Kaiwa and Fahim, I, I think you, you heard the comments. I think it's a lovely case. So you already done a lot of upfront uh, assessments. So maybe I'll hand it back to you and see how you will treat it. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, uh, and the uh, great comments from the panel. 
So uh, I think uh, we, we feel that a lot of times when we do DCB angioplasty, we base uh, our sizing and understanding, uh, uh, sizing based on uh, angiogram, but we feel that uh, we should go further to do some kind of intracoronary imaging to understand the plug morphology and sizing will be more accurate. Uh. So what we did was we did a, a IBIS pullback with the uh, high definition uh, from Boston and we would like to show uh, the pullback. Uh. Okay. So this is pulling back from the distal LAD uh, quite normal segment uh, and there's some fibrous plug as you can see in the distal LAD. So apologize for some uh, signal dropout over here. So uh, you can see that the artery is quite normal looking, uh, just some uh, fibrous plug with quite minimal calcium. So size wise maybe it's about uh, trio uh, over in the mid LAD as we are pulling back. So the area of interest will be the proximal LAD. Again, I think uh, uh, I find it's very useful to do uh, imaging nowadays because you understand the uh, plug morphology. So you have something that is fibrous, uh, it tends to respond quite well to your scoring balloon. Uh. So we are coming to the uh, area of interest soon. So again, quite normal looking, uh, good lumen area. I can see some uh, uh, fibrous plug. We will freeze at the uh, segment later. So the size is getting bigger, uh, lumen is quite uh, non-obstructive. Yeah, over here. So this is the uh, uh, area of interest in the prox LED just before the first septal. Uh. So you can see from here that uh, the MLA is 2.7 uh, and the plug burden is about 80%. Uh. So uh, plug morphology is uh, fibrous. Uh. So looking at this, uh, any comments from the panel? I mean, uh, how can I, can I invite Dr. Hong? Uh, Dr. Hong, would you like to comment on the IVIS? What's your opinion of it? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, the, in regarding to the uh, distal lesion, is a small vessel. You know, is that the lesion was uh, packed with uh, the uh, plug. So the, it is um, uh, if the uh, functional study shows a uh, significant, it should be a treat. Regarding to the in the proximal vessel. The lumen area is a 2.7. Anyhow, this is uh, the indication for the PCI in the uh, based on uh, the imaging finding. Thank you, Hong Bang. Um, you know what? What do you make of it now that you've seen the uh, physiological studies and IVA studies? How would you approach it? Hi. Good morning, everyone. Very interesting case. So we have uh, a diffuse disease vessel with uh, tandem lesions. Uh, from the functional assessment, it suggests that the distal needs to be treated, not the proximal. So now we've got imaging. So we have a mismatch with a bit of dilemma. This proximal lesion, as what uh, Dr. Hong said, uh, the MLA is uh, less than 5, it's 2.7. So I'm curious whether we should now follow the, you know, the MLA to make decision to treat, or should we stick to physiology and say not, not to intervene? Uh, I, I'm curious to know the plaque characteristic of this. wonder whether the you know, comment can be made about the plaque characteristic in terms of risk, whether this is a high risk or this is a low risk plaque. Would that be an important determinant? Okay, so some discussion so about the plaque. It looks more like a fibrolipidic plaque. Yeah. So this is the non culprit oh, lesion. Plaque, if you um, colloquially say, yeah. Yeah. Although, of course, there, there are some recent studies that suggest that you know, even the non culprit side, there are some vulnerable plaques here. Um, can I maybe, you know, Dr. Theodore Matai, uh, maybe you can help. Uh, what you, you've seen the IVIS, maybe can we just play the IVIS again? Do you mind? Yeah. So play, the, play the IVIS again, please? Yeah, can we just play so the IVIS the images again while we're discussing it? Yeah. Uh, start from the yeah. beginning. Yeah. How, how, would you, how would you look at this IVIS and you know, how would that also change your mm, management plan, uh, Dr. Matai? Yeah. Yeah, 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 well, yeah, actually, exactly. I think yeah. we all agree for the, for the distal lesion that we should, uh, we should use a drug-coated balloon. How much? And then there's the proximal. The proximal, I, I, I would Which test, and fine. actually, Sorry. I haven't seen in IVIS um, the proximal uh, landing zone to see if ever there is uh, any complication, if we have a landing zone to put a, a stent over there. But uh, otherwise, I, I would surely, okay. I would surely dilate the, the proximal lesion also. 
So you're more thinking of like a hybrid approach to try and do drop-coated balloons in dissolution and then land the stand in the proximal, correct? We, we could see how things work um, by ballooning, by, by preparing the lesion. Uh, but uh, we also have to, have to see that uh, if we have a landing zone and if we can stand, and where should we put a stand, if ever? So we can show you the IVAS. Uh, you know, you'll see the landing zone uh, if there is one proximally in your, in your view. Uh, we just let it play out. We saw a nice distal so landing zone too. So maybe maybe we will mm -hmm. stop our discussion and pass it back to yes, Fahim and Kaiwa, see what picture. your plan will be. Nitro. So we have uh, done some uh, using this Corflex 175 on the distal LAD. So for, for lesion preparation, uh, I especially like the NC Scorflex because I feel that uh, give us a very good uh, luminal gain. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I uh, tend to undersize and go very high pressure on that. So not too bad initial, uh, after the initial dilatation. Yeah. So you've done the distal lesion first, yeah. right? One, one yeah, five, yeah. That was 1.5 score flats, correct? Oh, 1.75. 1.75. 1.75 and how five the lesion for... The lesion is at that diagonal, you know, that little diag that's coming off. So we went up to 24 atmospheres. So the distal LED, 21. 24 bars, correct? Yes, right, that's right. Two? Oh, yeah, we get a 2015. So I tend to undersize and then gradually upsize and then, uh, I mean, because I think if you keep to the balloon to vessel ratio of less than 1.1, then there's less chance of uh, causing dissection. Maybe we can ask the panel, uh, what do they use for their lesion preparation? I mean, I, some people may, may use the NC balloon or some people may use the Wolverine. So maybe we can have a discussion on what's their preference for the uh, lesion prep. Uh. So on cue for that, k Wun, how, how do you normally do your DCB uh, lesion prep? Uh, with the use of uh, intravascular imaging, it does give us a lot of information, whether it's calcified, fibrous, and that can sway, whether we use uh, semi-compliant balloons, non-compliant versus a scoring or cutting yeah. balloon when it's more calcified or diffuse. No. Um, question here is whether we do a stepwise balloon dilatation like what Hiwa has done, a 175 then a 20, yeah, or be guided right. by the imaging and go straight for what we think is the reference uh, size so and a bigger balloon. Is there okay. actual advantage yeah. in doing well. such stepwise balloon dilatation? So I'm going to be a little bit, you know, cause a bit of controversy. Is it really that necessary to do intravascular imaging if you are actually up front going down the route of um, uh, drug coated balloon? So maybe I'll direct this question back to Bruno. Do, is, do you routinely do intravascular imaging if your, your standard practice is going to be DCB? No, we do no. not do no. this routinely, but you have to be aware that reimbursement no. in Germany is limited for, for, for intravascular imaging. Um, but nevertheless, I, I do prefer not to use imaging after lesion prep because Picture. then you have a very high crossover rate to stenting because the other section, the sections are the mechanism of angioplasty. Okay. And if you see it, then you tend to use a stent. Thank you. Can we go one more time? Or? Okay, well, what's happening? No, we, we, we are uh, doing the uh, pre dilatation of the distal LAD with the. 15 score flex now. 16? Yeah. So I think the beauty here so is very the diffuse diffuse, score right? flex. So you, you can actually size your predilatation yes. balloon very precisely. In Thailand, I mean, I, I presume, Dr. Anak, um, in Thailand you do a lot of truck the balloons. Would, would this be a case that you will stand or would out. you have Take gone down yeah. the same practice of uh, DCB right. in this vessel? How would you have managed it? Actually, in, in Thailand, uh, this is not still not reimbursed, so that uh, mainly we just uh, use uh, then the, the proximal LED and, and, and maybe uh, yeah, the yeah, at the distal. So so that uh, from from the 
uh, imaging finding. I, I think the, uh, the Postma ID yeah, is very, yeah. very uh, high lesion. Okay, yeah, I'm out right And yeah. I, I wonder that uh, if you you do PCI on the proximal lesion, will you protect the, the diagonal? Because of it's, uh, it's a very tight uh, of the ostium of the diagonal. Okay, so, Sorry. but you, you were saying in Thailand, DCP is not reimbursed. So you, you will still do DCP in the distal LVD or would you, you will still do it? Mainly, uh, oh, I will good. use it for the distal LVD. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, right. But the proximal is a bit uh, thin. Okay. So, Kai I will let you focus on your case um, and, and get, get your, okay. your devices back in position that we will we'll have a little more discussion uh, here uh, in, in the Congress. So, um, the, oh, Rosli. I, I mean, the way that, uh, it's interesting the way that we are evolving, especially with DCB, and uh, you can see that there's uh, increasing use of DCB and the companies are investing to it. So, um, you know, for, for me, for example, my practice nowadays is that uh, for <laughs> suitable lesions, and it's uh, quite a majority of lesions are considered suitable, uh, I would pre-prepare the vessel first and then so see the results. Long, if the results are really acceptable, then we would uh, put in a DCB. Uh, but I see the whole world, if you look at the way that it's going to go, it's probably most, go uh, most likely going to be a hybrid procedure, uh, whereby uh, I think people would be more comfortable to stand uh, the LED rather than the otherwise. So in our own, own, own hospital, 50% of patients would receive a DCB. Uh, out of that, 10% are two DCBs alone. And uh, uh, so on personal basis, I'm, I'm probably going to be more than that. Uh, so, but I think uh, this is interesting and in, uh, seeing how the world evolves around the use of DCB. Uh, maybe you can ask Hong Bang, you know, you do quite a bit of physiology uh, uh, related uh, DCBs, you know, do you think that just balloons and then if they are okay, uh, physiology wise, can just uh, use DCBs alone or? Yeah, so I think in principle, that's what we're now trying to, uh, trying to advocate, that we should be uh, focusing more on the physiology, particularly in the chronic, uh, you know, stable patient. Uh, I think we have evidence, uh, you know, from the FAME study that uh, uh, either for deferring PCI or uh, using FFR to guide our, you know, our decision and uh, to optimize our PCI procedure. I'm curious in this case, just now, after the QFR, how many of us would say we'll treat the distal? I, I think it's probably all, if not most. But if we ask how many of us would treat the proximal based on the physiology, you know, I'll, I'll be curious, before the IVUS, you know what I'm saying? We have good evidence for distal, uh, we have good evidence for small vessels. But for large proximal, you know, evidence is still emerging if it's, if it's not, you know, not there yet, yeah? Uh, I'm not sure, you want to put a vote, you know, if you can still, uh, without the cognitive bias and ask ourselves, without the IVUS, just based on physiology, would we have, uh, how many of us we have made a decision and say, treat that proximal or leave it? You mean how many of us would, would treat, treat the proximal with DCB or stent or treat it or at all? Treat or not to treat. Oh, okay. So, so maybe we, we have time, we can have a show of hands here among all the audience. Who would, who would have treated the, who, uh, without knowing the physiological studies, purely based on the IVUS? Who would oh, treat? Oh, no, no, Bef uh, based on the physiology. Okay. Uh, IVUS came later. So it's based on uh, the QFR. Based on the QFR, who will treat the proximal LED show of hands? Who would treat the proximal LED? 20. Not many, okay. Who would, who would leave the proximal LED alone? Can I have a show of hands? Okay. Wow, well, you are the minority, but Nitro. you know, Prof Ko put his hand up, so I think that counts something else too. So Kaiwa, how are you getting on? Yeah, we, we, we finished uh, uh, doing the lesion prep for the distal LED. I think we had a very nice luminal gain. So we move on to do uh, the lesion prep for the uh, Prox LED. And uh, we use the NC Scoreflex uh, 3010. HLR1. Wow. Uh, we might have to take a different view just to make sure that we don't have any uh, are dissection. You, are you cranial? So do you think, do you think you want to do another QFR for us? Uh, if we have time, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think we have time, right? 
He looks, he, lo he looks pretty good. Pretty good, just, yeah. So the distal lesion was at that little diag, just for landmarks, and the proximal lesion was at just proximal to that diag septal nexus. So it's kind of. Now I know when we the, when we uh, yeah. when we look at this case, there are some doubts about whether we should stand the proximal LED. So maybe I will explain this question now, looking at this result. Maybe I'll ask Dr. Hong again. Two or are, are you happy with the proximal two, LED vision preparation? Two, two or would you be comfortable with doing going down the DCB route, or would you still want to put a stand in the proximal LED? Come back to the AP premium. For me, is that the, I usually, uh, this kind of the region is a distal LED is a DCB, and the proximal region is a drug looting stand, not the DCB. Not the balloon, okay, so irrespective of the lesion prep, okay. Bruno, you, you are itching to go. Um, if, you, if you look at the result of lesion prep in the proximal LED, you can see that uh, we have no impairment of the septal branch, and we have no impairment of the diagonal branch, which is very close to the, the initial lesion. If you stand, I doubt that you uh, will spare the, the septal and the diagonal branch. And, and therefore, I think this is a perfect case for, for not implanting a stand, because in addition, we know that the, the, the ostium of the diagonal okay. branch will also look better over time. There's very nice uh, IBIS work okay. from, from Korea showing that even if you do not treat the, the side branch, but have the DCB over the, uh, its origin, it gets better over time, and this is the perfect uh, yep. situation. Yep, lovely. So, Deborah, you have a you have this, a question from the audience. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we have yeah. one question here. I mean, after doing the proximal LED, it looks fantastic, no, but we have a very sizable yeah. uh, first diagonal branch. So the question is, would you do a kissing DCB of the proximal LED and D1 lesion? Okay, I think can uh, can go up now. Can go up now. Six. Okay. So, so now we are inflating the the first DCB uh, sequence, please, at uh, 220 in the distal LED. Right. Okay, well, would so you, would minimum you is about 30 seconds. Uh. Okay, while well, you have that time up, uh, would you do anything with the diagonal? Uh, Bruno mentioned that DCB of the LED, you can leave the diagonal alone because the beauty of it, you won't lose the side branch. But the audience asked the question, would you tackle the side branch? Would you do kissing DCB of the first diagonal and the proximal LED? Uh, probably not now, probably not now. I think the incremental value of that is limited. Um, I think pragmatically speaking, if we get both lesions open, we're good. The, uh, I'd like to ask the, uh, the uh, operator, what I mean One is, minute? Uh, yeah. what is the, the main histological target for the DCB? What is uh, the uh, intima? or media or the advantia, advantia. What is the, the main target for the drug? So do you know that we have to know that what is the penetration depth by the, the drug? Uh, so you mean a, uh, in a small vessel, uh, the drug was a easily yeah, yeah. penetrate the, the uh, advantia. However, in the proximal vessel, there is a lot of the plaque. So the penetration of the drug to the advantia is a practically is a some difficult and uh, anyhow we have to know about that the the history about the angioplasty you know that in the era of the just the poba a long time ago the recurrence rate or around the, the 40 percent and uh, after the introduction of the, the bare metal stand uh, recurrence rate was a uh, 25 what is the, the uh, underlying mechanism of the recurrence rumen narrowing? In the, the intravascular imaging study, almost to be 20 or 25 years ago, the demonstrator main rumen uh, narrowing by the balloon angioplasty is a chronic re uh, narrowing, is uh, the vessel shrinkage is uh, predominantly two third of it. And the neo-intimal proportion is uh, the only one third of it is a uh, main mechanism of the POBA by the, the lumen narrowing. After the introduction of the bare metal stand, anyhow, prevention of the chronic recalling or vascular sh shrinkage was prevented by the, the structure of uh, the metal itself. Yep. So, and then what is the, the 
the next advantage, development of the drug eluting stand implantation, neo-intimal proliferation was uh, strongly enabled. <coughs> so what is the, the main action for the drug coating balloon in the large vessel? Is the uh, inhibition of the neo-intimal proliferation or the prevention of the chronic vascular constriction? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I know Cliff right is going to show us this beautiful QFR results, but since Dr. Hong brought up a very important point contrasting stem, uh, stent ES with DCB, maybe I will just take this debate one step further. Maybe I'll ask uh, Bruno, would you mind commenting on it? And I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts as well, uh, Rosli, afterwards. So we, we have s several components. Uh, number one is your lesion preparation. You, you have to you have to avoid that you have elastic recoil. That, that's, that has to be done with your lesion preparation. Number two, you want to avoid neo-intimal proliferation by addressing the adventitia. Number three, uh, we uh, achieved okay some growth of the total vessel. Yeah, uh, and this is uh, addressing the adventitia by, by the drug. So, so we have s uh, several mechanisms com coming together, and lesion preparation plays a very important role in this, this whole procedure. Um. Yeah, I think uh, that's an uh, important question to be brought, brought up. Uh, and um, so uh, what Bruno said that, uh, you know, we won't uh, consider DCB if, let's say, there's a re residual uh, resonances of um, uh, residual stenosis of more than 30 percent, because then, you know, the, the recall is going to be much worse. And I feel that that's uh, in my practice that that's more important than having dissection in terms mm -hmm. of resonances. Secondly is that uh, with packet axle does go deep and it goes to the tissue and when you prepare the vessel, you find that I mean, in normal uh, uh, angioplasty, balloon angioplasty, you find the section and this is where it's good because then you can uh, ensure that this drug goes right through. Uh, and, uh, and there's a number of studies uh, that showed that uh, at least more than 60% of the studies that uh, you can actually have vessel enlargement and vessel enlargement is not uh, really due to um, uh, positive modeling is just that the vessel enlarges. So, it's, so that's, I think that's something which is... Uh, that positive modeling, yes, right. Maybe I'll just pause the discussion because I saw a beautiful QFR post, uh, POBA, post lesion prep. So can I hand back to Tantoxing to comment on this? So can we show the QFR uh, post? This is before the DCBE. No, that's after this. Uh, this is after the POBA. After, after the... After the POVA, yeah. yeah. So please, for, you can comment, no, please. Yeah, can we hear some comment? Because not all of us are familiar with QFR. Yeah, so uh, this is actually after the initial POVA. We saw very good angiographic results, and hence we decided to go ahead with the QFR again, as suggested by Dr. Paul. And you can see that actually we can have a very smooth luminal, and the graph actually of the pressure drop of the QFR is very smooth as well. The previous two drops that was committed by the proximal LED lesion as well as the distal LED lesion is actually nearly gone. And you can see a very flat pressure graph at the moment. So at the system right now, the QFR is actually 0.96, which is very close to the 1.0 normal threshold. And they only picked up a lesion at the distal LED of a delta QFR drop of 0.02, showing very good results from the initial POBA results. Uh, Upal, do you do much QFR in your in your days in UK and Sri Lanka? Unfortunately, not in Sri Lanka, but in UK, not in Sri Lanka. Quite a lot of uh, not QFR. It's mainly with IFR and uh, If I have a second about large vessels, uh, uh, please. Nor yeah. Thanks. Norwich has got probably the largest data sets uh, when it comes to large vessels. DCB only, PCI no, and we we, I think we're uh, close to epicotal, treat epicotal. about nearly 5,000 lesions, about 60% of them would be large vessels. So uh, quarter, if, quarter. even though I don't have answer for the histological uh, you know, action, we can say by clinical outcomes, they behave the same. The large vessels behave the same as they would do in small vessels, yeah. clinical outcomes-wise. Thanks. Uh, but I think yeah, this QFR yeah. you know, also demonstrated okay. you, your lesion uh, prep has been adequate. So we earlier on talk about 30% rec residual recoil, we talk about dissection grading, but now we also have extra Stable physiological dissection. studies demonstrating that you have overcome the initial ischemia or flow limitation. So it's really nice, nice findings. Um, Kaiwa, do you want to carry on and show us what you've been doing? Yeah. So uh, we have done the uh, DCB angioplasty for the uh, PROX LED. We use a sequence, please, uh, 3015. 
and uh, you can see that uh, we have quite a nice luminal gain. But I think it's important to take multiple views. Uh, you can see that it's a stable type B dissection from the apicordal. Show the apicordal view. Can you see the uh, type B dissection? So we, we're going to do an Ivers pullback and see the uh, uh, the luminal gainer. Let me ask the uh, what size of the drop coating balloon for the proximal LED? What size? Is it? Uh, 3015. 30. Yes. Uh, Edu? So maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Scheller, would you, would you leave this dissection or would you stent it? Before Prabhu before no cuts in, maybe I'll ask Edu because I haven't got him involved yet. So what do you think of the result? Would you, would you call it a day or you want to put a stent in? Uh, uh, thanks, Paul. So um, actually the result angiography looked good. Um, I, I think there is some dissection, but that's expected after, that's after ballooning. And it's actually one of the mechanisms of your scoring balloon. Um, so I think there's mm -hmm. no reason to fear the dissection. I'll actually call it a day over here. So, so sorry, you, you, you are accepting that? that yeah, I'll accept the dissection. It's obviously in the right room for, for that. Uh, Deborah, okay. you know, you've done a lot of this Start case recording. together with us. How, what do you think of this? Would you want to do more work? I think because of the diffuse disease, my strategy was DCB from the start, and the dissection looks type B. It's not like, um, so stable dissection in the proximal LED, good luminal gain. Um, I will leave it. Okay, Bruno, what would you think? Um, so we have two arguments to leave it. Argument number one is if we say it's type B dissection, which I agree because we have no staining outside of contrast medium. But even if it would be classified as type C, if we say because it's outside of, of, of the lumen where we see the contrast, um, I would leave it because we have this functional measurement showing uh, us that this is perfect flow, there's no flow, flow limitation. And I think uh, we have two, two types of type C um, uh, dissections. The, the, the one type is flow limiting, this has to be stented, but the other type C dissection with perfect flow, as is the case here, do, does not need to be stented. No. So that's, that's the dissection. Thank you. So we're doing the Ivers pullback now. Good luminal gain. Can I, can I maybe invite uh, Kay Woon and then after that, uh, Dr. Hong yeah. to comment yeah. on the IVUS. Yeah. So Kay Woon, what, what, what do you think of the angiographic results and, and the IVUS findings? Yeah, we do see the dissection, but so far flow is good. IVUS so far good luminal gain. Don't see any obvious dissection, maybe you'll not reach. I think it comes proximal, you show the dissection. Maybe it's close to the proximal. It's just play that. So with the intimal and the media. Yeah, but good Luna game, as what was commented right there, earlier, there. we do expect okay. this dissection after scoring yeah. balloon. Yeah. But it's not flow Let's limiting. Do a dynamic review, dynamic. So you can see that uh, there is a dissection uh, around the five o'clock area. But we did, we did achieve a good uh, luminal area gain. So Dr. Hong? It's relatively short. <coughs> this kind of the imaging is uh, more frequently obje was uh, observed in the uh, balloon, just a simple balloon and just plus the area. And now we have uh, some guideline, European guideline, what we do, uh, treat the uh, dissection or not in the European uh, consensus document is that the uh, length or the depth and the, in the imaging, in the in IBC imaging, so the dissection was uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, observed was from the 6 o'clock to the 9 o'clock. The severity looks like uh, some uh, severe, but the personally, uh, I think it's uh, this kind of the dissection for the uh, just the drug coating balloon is that the uh, yeah, like looks the like uh, some the yeah, no, therapeutic no, dissection. No. So personally, I'd like to let it alone. But the, uh, we have to think about that the, in the compared to the balloon angioplasty and the stand error. 
uh, when you have uh, just uh, let it alone, about uh, uh, 19, about uh, 12 patients is uh, the maybe uh, uh, safe and uh, comfortable. But nobody knows is, uh, what, this kind of criteria is 100% uh, perfect. Nobody knows. So uh, okay. as uh, the physician or an operator, That's can true. you sleep at night uh, when okay. you come back sure. home? So I don't worry about that. I just stand along uh, that it, and uh, I, I want to sleep uh, today. It's a usual our practice it's method. Okay, yeah. Why do we it's worry it's about it's this kind of uncommon complication? Prof, Prof uh, you know, this is the debate that we always have. Yeah. Should we, are we able to sleep at night with leaving the dissection behind? You, you've done more angioplasty than all of us here. At together. How, what's your point view of that? Yeah, I think if you really see the, the flow limiting dissections uh, or, or tap C or whatever, then more, more likely that you're. Uh, more agreeable to implant okay. stents. Yeah. I think other than that, uh, especially with the physiology guidance that is good, uh, I think it's not unreasonable if you are thinking about a drug coated strategy to, to, to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Rossi got more experience <laughs> for DCBs than you, me, so maybe you know, get his opinion. You know, with the advent yeah, of table, DCBs, table. I learn how to appreciate uh, dissections and the ones yeah, you feel. No, 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 no. So, uh, with the type B, the, the most important thing is, we, we, as we, long we, we, as the we, flow we, we, is good, we, 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 and if you're concerned, you wait a while, maybe five minutes, ten minutes, you take one shot, and the flow is still good, I will be able to sleep well at night. That has been something that I've been experiencing, and I appreciate that uh, the dissection, that uh, at least you learn about dissections, and uh, the DCB is actually uh, push this uh, understanding. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rosali uh, comment about that the, about the 50 percent of the, the DCB patient was uh, the, there is uh, some lumen enlargement at the follow-up. I think it's uh, maybe there is uh, some uh, uh, action by the drug itself, but the Part of it is uh, like a very aggressive uh, angioplasty. You mean that in a long time ago, the uh, Japanese uh, DCA cut, very, very aggressive cut, the approach to the, the adventitia. It makes a uh, huge enlargement at the follow with the vessel. So the actually, without the, the uh, DCV, just uh, let it alone with uh, the aggressive angioplasty, like uh, with uh, the, some kind of the therapeutic dissection, when we have a follow, there is uh, some lumen enlargement. So uh, uh, we heard all the comments. So basically, we have taken taken up the wire. I think it's important to have a wire-free shot at the end. And we took the point of Dr. Rossley that you know sometimes you wait for a two three minutes, making sure that the dissection does not progress into something more sinister. So uh, just show you the final pictures. Yeah, looks good. He looks really good. HLR1. So, so would you be doing yet another QFR after this? Uh, yes, I think it's on the way. How long does it take you to do a QFR in Tandok Singh? Uh, less than five minutes. Sir. Getting faster and faster. So that's, I guess, is yeah. the beauty of you don't have to recross it with a wire to get the FFR and IFR, right? If QFR, you can just base on the angio. Yes, yes. So we, we I think we, some I mean, of us would... Yeah. As it is, we have good luminal gain, Paul, so you expect the uh, physiology to be better. Yeah. Uh, so any, any comment from the panel on this sorry, case? Yeah. Maybe a question since we have all the experts here. In practical terms, choice of DCB, we know that there's no class effect and there's a wide variety of DCB, like a base, limus base. How would you choose a DCB in such well, small drip. vessel disease? Drip. So the choice of DCB, uh, the choice of DCB today obviously is the free brown sequence, please. Um, but um, maybe, Bruno, you, you started the DCB journey uh, all the way back. So I, I think this might just overlap with your questions, uh, your lectures later on, but just a quick view, your, your view on Sarolimus versus Pactotaxel. That's really good. Yeah. 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 Um, Thanks for help. Uh, I have it in my presentation later on. Okay, we'll, <coughs> so we'll hold that question. I think there's a question from the audience. Maybe Deborah can just bring it up. 
This question is mainly directed in the QFR. Um, the question is, would the dissection affect the QFR result or is it irrespective due to flow? I mean, is QFR flow dependent or um, I guess if the flow is okay, then the QFR won't be affected. Yeah, um, so Cliff, would you like to answer this question? Hi. So unfortunately, I think QFR has not been validated in dissections, but so far when we're seeing that there is good contour and then you can use it to mark out the um, findings, it's actually correlating quite well with the IFR and FFR. Final one, yeah. So uh, if I may just direct you back to the QFR that we did after the DCB. So um, although there's the dissection, but you can see very good contour of the whole vessel and especially the lumen as well. And you can see that the QFR actually at the end of the procedure is 0.95, which is much better Paul, than can, the 0.5. Can you see the QFR screen? Yeah. So, so Cliff, okay. are there any data on using QFR? Uh, you know, they are, they are increasing in the data showing that, you know, the final FFR using wires actually show uh, some improvement. Um, are there any data on the final QFR uh, used uh, in, in looking at the outlook on the patients in clinical endpoints, et cetera? Yes, so actually there's more for um, post denting and then if QFR is much more than 0 0.90 and actually it's pretty good long-term outcomes. But uh, to say that it's been studied in a randomized controlled trial, not yet, but hopefully it will be coming soon. Um, but otherwise for our own in-house data, after that when we have actually a good QFR results post DEB of more than 0.85, um, the long-term results has actually been pretty good. Thank you. Um, I think we, we are, we are, you know, we've got about three more minutes uh, before we, we cut and uh, go to the uh, lectures. So maybe I'll I invite um, uh, Dr. Ho and Dr. Fahim uh, to, sh to look at the case together and share your thoughts on, on your case. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, to everyone again. Uh, I think today's uh, case is just to demonstrate the use of uh, DCB angioplasty in uh, de novo disease. I think we, we are moving beyond uh, ISR already, so clearly there's clear indications in small vessels. So the, today's uh, uh, target lesion that is uh, a lot of creating a lot of discussion is the proximal LAD, but I think increasingly I think we feel that if we have a good lesion prep, we have a stand-like result, uh, we could possibly treat it with a drug-coated balloon. And I think increasingly we're using physiology to assess moderate lesions, and I increasingly find that it is useful to use intracoronary imaging because you understand the blood morphology, and also the uh, sizing. So I think uh, it's quite helpful, I feel, that uh, uh, to do the DCGB angioplasty. And an important lesson is that, you know, when you have a significant dissection, you have to do the bailout stenting. Uh, that's something that we would like to emphasize. Uh, Fahim, you have any? Uh, no, I think you pretty much summarized it. I mean, you know, there's always uh, an inherent degree of discomfort leaving a dissection, but our own experience has been that these patients do very well as long as it's a type B or below discussion, uh, the dissection. If it's more extensive, I would stent. And we don't have any hesitation stenting as a bailout. Uh, you know, it works quite well. Great. Just, yeah. just and then the last point part, is yep. about the QFR, I think. Yeah. The QFR, I think, uh, we, I mean, we were quite happy that we can demonstrate the usefulness in assessing the non corporate lesions. You can see that the value is consistent two weeks ago and today. And it also helps us to assess our post-PCI results. Uh. So hopefully uh, everyone learned something from uh, today's session. Uh. And just, you know, quick, quick uh, summary, you know, in terms of how would you lesion prep, because that's probably the most important, difficult part of DCB angioplasty. So Kaiwa, just a very quick uh, tips on uh, pros of wisdom. How, how I, do I think you lesion prep, uh, you, can use, you can use the scoring balloon or a Wolverine, and uh, you usually keep the balloon to vessel ratio uh, less than 1.1. And of course, if you have very calcified lesions, you have to use arterectomy or IVL. I think the, according to the international consensus recommendation, if you have a residual stenosis 30% or less, Dimitri flow uh, with no high-grade dissection, then you can possibly treat the lesion with a drug called the balloon. Okay, I think, you know, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to Kaiwa and Fahim and the team from Tantoxing for this beautiful demonstration of a DCB-only angioplasty. You know, it's lovely results, and Cliff, you know, very good. Thank you very much for the QFR demonstration as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
i'll hand it back to the prof.